This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Think Tech Asia. And we have the honor of Andrew Anderson today. Andrew Anderson is an entrepreneur in the fullest sense of the word. I went to Punahou and then Puget Sound University. And, uh, then, and then he became an entrepreneur. He's all over the place. And we want to focus today on Andrew's experiences and adventures. At, I call it two years at the entrepreneurial mast, okay, in Asia, where he was in business there. Ooh. It just yeah. ended now. So <clears throat> let's talk about, well, welcome to the show, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Good to be back. I have, to, I have full disclosure, Andrew was our first staffer here at ThinkTech. Uh, he, was, he was younger then, but not, not shorter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, I think that was seven or eight years ago now. Yeah. So. When we were in the basement here at Pioneer Plaza, just setting up our initial studio in Pioneer Plaza, Andrew was here. And when we moved us. into that basement. When we moved into that basement, which was quite a move. We came from uh, the Davies building at that time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, great to see you. Great to have you back. I know you're, you're here only for a few days, but I'm so happy that we can talk to you now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just moved back, actually, from Asia a few months ago. As you mentioned, I was there for about two years. Uh, we were working on a software platform out there, uh, and it had some success. Uh, it had some struggles, as most startups do, uh, but fantastic experience. Yeah, let's well, let's uh, unpack that. Okay. All right. What kind of software platform were you working on? So we were connecting international travelers to boutique adventure operators, providing a platform where people could book. Uh, where the operators could manage their bookings and a uh, payment gateway. So this was taking an offline market and trying to bring it online. So we had packages anywhere from whitewater rafting for a day in Bali to... Whitewater uh, rafting in Bali, wow. Yeah, to uh, Everest Base Camp type expedition. Everest Base Camp, oh um, my God. Everything in between that. So yeah. I, I saw an article in the paper recently that you know 5,000 people have actually achieved the summit you know, it's since, um, I forget his name, the guy who did it originally. Uh, uh, Hillary? Hillary? Yeah, Edmund Hillary. Yeah. Um, so Edmund Hillary's Sherpa was actually a guy named Tenzing Norgai. Yeah. And we had Tenzing Norgai's son as Is our, right? um, yeah, as our, one of our operators. Small world. Yeah. This is pretty interesting stuff, though. You're offering, you know, really uh, unusual, adventurous tours. Yeah, I think, so the big thing was, there are so many opportunities out there, but right now it's just such a pain to find the right ones and to be able to actually uh, book securely and have everything safe when you're going to a uh, more undeveloped area in the world. Yeah, so let's so, talk about that as the challenge. You know, it was part of your thing to find the tours, to find the, uh, the Everest thing, to find the white rotor rafting thing. Um, so you, you, know, you start out one morning and say, my name is Andrew Anderson. I'm going to find an adventure tour today in the backwoods of Asia. How do you do that? Yeah, I, so that was just through a lot of networks, uh, reaching out to different people. Most of these companies are on TripAdvisor, so it's not this one guy who's in the jungles of Sumatra, um, but rather it's a company of maybe 10 people. Uh, so they do have a little digital marketing guy who manages their TripAdvisor page, responds to emails, um, but still the, those smaller companies would ask for either a wire transfer beforehand, or uh, pay when you get there, and they're not even sure if you're going to show up, so they could lose out on that. Um, so <laughs> it's really catch as catch can. <laughs> yeah, and there's now. This was years ago that we were doing this. The company's no longer existent, so I'm not plugging <laughs> okay, this at all. all right. uh, but Airbnb has different uh, experience type uh, bookings now. Uh, not so much in these more underdeveloped areas, um, but they are kind of trending towards that. And there are a few other companies out there that are doing a similar thing with a little bit of a different strategy. Yeah. So let me, you know, let me just uh, grab onto this thing. You found them on the net because they, they would have somebody who was running some kind of website, and you could look them up on the net and get an, a handle on what they were doing. Yeah. So we, 
It was a combination of a few things. Uh, we had account managers in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia. These are local people who live there. Yeah, speak local dialect. Um, so we had them kind of do initial screens and reach out to these people, uh, make sure they had the right government regulation or uh, registrations. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of took it a step further to look at all their reviews, see how they were uh, based on their customer uh, responses. So you would look at customers who had been through that particular yeah. uh, adventure tour. We, we did our due diligence on everyone because as you go into the more adventurous market, safety becomes such a big issue. Oh, yeah. Um, especially since the type of people who we were targeting weren't the backpacking crew. It was more of the um, higher-end travelers. I'm not going to say luxury travelers, <laughs> but travelers with more disposable income. Yeah. Um, so we had another and lawyers and lawyers and lawyers back home lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah we we did have a few, um, but yeah. So our we really were looking for quality over quantity on that, um, and a lot of people came in through referrals. Uh, so for instance, we had a operator in Sabah, Malaysian Borneo, um, who had about 60 employees uh, and was running various treks throughout Borneo. Um, and he was able to refer me to the dive company that he partners with. Diving too? Yep. Uh, we, <laughs> of course. Diving. We had a ton of different sports. Yeah. So we wanted to be the one-stop shop for the adventure traveler. If you want to go to this country, this specific region, uh, what can you do there? Um, and then you can look through things, book immediately, see reviews, um, or if you want to sort by sport. So say you're uh, living in Singapore, where our company was based, um, and you want to travel from Singapore, and you want to go skydiving, but you don't know where you want to go. You can also search for that function. Um, so great experience. Uh, living in Singapore was... You like Singapore. Singapore is Singapore's a fantastic Singapore's an expensive city. place, no? It, for four years in a row, was rated the most expensive city in the world. Um, but those studies assume that you buy a car, which you don't need. Yeah, cars um, are really expensive. And so they add, so they double the price with some kind of they, tariff, no? They have a 200% import tax. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you need what's called a COE, which is essentially a permit to use the car for a 10-year period. Um, and they do that through an auction system. So that can range from, uh, I think one year it was only like $3,000. Another year, it was $150,000. This is the right to use it. This is the, yeah, a permit to use that specific car for 10 years. So and the reason happens, is they don't want old cars on the highway, right? They don't want old cars, and they want to limit the traffic. Mm. So for all our Oahu-based listeners, Singapore is half the size of Oahu landmass with 5.5 million people and no traffic whatsoever. <laughs> so if you ever want a, a solution to public transport, Put a two hundred thousand dollar tax on every car. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Eh, it'd you know, be a, it, a tough pitch for a, a, a tough pitch because people in Hawaii love their cars. They love their fossil fuel cars. I might add. Yeah. Um, so what about housing? How 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 did you deal with uh, housing in Singapore? Housing's expensive too. Yeah. Um, we I was there with my now fiance, uh, and we were staying in a two bedroom, fairly modest. We were paying about three thousand a month. Mm. I had friends who were paying ten thousand dollars. Wow! Um, young people, young entrepreneurs like yourself. Uh, he was a managing director for UBS, uh, investment banking. So okay. he had UBS paying. It for helps the work for a bank. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, nondescript bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not. Well, you know, I I know people too. Who yeah. <laughs> <coughs> they do very well in Singapore, working for large banks. Yeah. You know? Most <clears throat> expats in Singapore are actually from either the UK or from Australia. There are relatively few Americans, with the exception of people from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So we... There's a lot of Hawaii people there? There's a lot of Hawaii people. Isn't that interesting? We had a high school reunion <laughs> in, in Singapore. Singapore okay. <laughs> and we had, I want to say, 45 people show up from my high school. That's alone. pretty good. For you, from your class? No, no. From, from Punahou from in general. Punahou. Okay. Uh, so pe well, people did come from like Myanmar, uh, they came from Hong Kong yeah. uh, for a large event, but yeah, um, yeah. There's a pretty 
strong Hawaii contingency. Isn't that there. something? It's yeah. great, yeah. So the quality of life every day, I mean, were there, were there things there that you wanted, the restaurants, uh, movies, uh, whatever else, the arts, the culture, was it all there for you? In Singapore, you get all the Western amenities you could ever imagine. It's probably the most developed city I've ever been to. Uh, but you have access to all of Southeast Asia, which is, in my opinion, a little bit more interesting. Um, so restaurants are great, expensive, but great. Uh, there's a ton of nightlife. They integrate their parks really well. Um, so you can go to an area where you have monkeys running around in the middle of the city. If that's what you like. If that's what you like. <laughs> Not many people do, <laughs> but they have them. Um, so Singapore, they're, the entire country is 50 years old, or like 52 now. Yeah. Um, and they were able to master plan their entire country because they are so new. And, uh, because and also because they're smart. Because they're, they're, they're smart. Everything they do seems to me to be really smart. Yep, absolutely. And they were able to have the vision uh, through their founder, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, who was more or less a benevolent dictator. Yeah. Uh, who had complete control over the country yeah. in 20 years for yeah. a 20 He made it what it is today, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we had a show about him from two people who knew him after uh, he died, and um, that's one of the most popular shows we ever did. It's yeah. been seen all over the world. People want to know more about Lee Kuan Yew. He, he's worshipped as a god in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, Singapore, fantastic place to live. I... Uh, it's extremely strategic to the utter chaos uh, and, and population. And that's what I want to talk to you about after the break. I want to discuss how you range out, you know, like the hub and the spokes to all of Southeast Asia from Singapore, which you did. Okay, we'll be right back. We're going to find out about the hub and the spokes and Andrew Anderson right after we come back. You'll see. Aloha kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there right now using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Okay, we're back, we're live with Andrew Anderson reminiscing about two years before the entrepreneurial mast, so to say, in Singapore. And one of the things about Singapore is that it's, it's, um, it's got access, quick access, to a number of places in Southeast Asia. So if you're in Singapore, it's like the capital, in, in business sense anyway, uh, to all these places. And can you talk about how that works? Yeah, I, so our company, for instance, I had 12 staff in Manila, um, and I would go there every three weeks, uh, which was, I want to say, a three-hour flight from Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, but you are a half an hour drive from Malaysia, uh, the Malaysian border. Um, you're a 45-minute flight to uh, Indonesia, if you go to the closest city. Jakarta is maybe an hour and 15, hour these and a half. These are successful economies now, so these They're are worthy economies. places to guess, visit. Guess how many people live in Indonesia? <clears throat> 100 million. Mm -hmm. 200 million. A billion. No. I, I, I want to say it's 280 million right now, so almost the size of the U.S., given per capita. Uh, spending is a lot lower than the U.S., yeah. but you have these huge markets that are still in the stage that they're essentially going from zero to one. Uh, and Singapore is located strategically in the middle of all of these uh, as a very stable hub for capital. So it's gone through a few different iterations of being a strategic port city, uh, having 
a stable government where uh, capital could come into and then further expand from. Mm -hmm. uh, and they built up a fairly successful manufacturing industry before it became really expensive. That's now being moved uh, to Malaysia, China, <laughs> Vietnam, et cetera. Um, but the government has just been very efficient at uh, choosing what industries and what ways to focus uh, their entire economy, which is helpful when your entire country is half the size of Oahu. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and you're remote. Yep. You, I mean, from uh, the Western world, anyway. Yeah. Not remote from Asia, though. Yeah, so there's a lot of companies that actually choose Singapore as their APAC headquarters over, say, Australia. Uh, my fiance works for Microsoft. Their APAC headquarters are in Singapore, not Sydney. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a strategic hub um, yeah. where you can be invested elsewhere but focus your headquarters in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. Do uh, you ever go to, it's just a, it's a, it's a digressionary thought. I do have them. Do you ever go to Santosa Island there? Santosa? Santosa. Santosa, yeah. Yeah, Santosa. yeah. yeah with the yeah. gambling, right? Huge. Uh, yeah, so Santosa is a completely man made uh, island off of Singapore, uh, which is known as more of a party spot. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of okay. beach clubs on this man made beach. Yeah. Uh, and they have these, the beaches are uh, corralled into these uh, pools but you can't go in the water because there's so much oil from the ship sitting oh, no. right outside of Singapore. So if you wade into the water, you'll come out with black spotches. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've been there. Uh, yeah. There's, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful area yeah. if you want to drink and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Singapore is not without fun. You know, I was there once a long time ago. So um, <clears throat> you know, the thing about it is uh, people I know, young people live in Singapore, they, they move around. They're, every weekend, is, it's, it's almost like Hawaii way back when, where you, you, know, you got your igloo together <laughs> and um, you know, put your lunch in it, and then off you went um, to exotic places like the neighbor islands. But people do that, don't they, in Singapore? You fly yeah. off to you know, any number of other capitals in Asia just for a short time to say hi. So, again, for work, I was probably traveling every three weeks uh -huh. uh, to a different country. And we were traveling probably every two weeks for either work or pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I think a big portion of that is you have a temporary population of expats there who know that they're going to be there for a limited amount of time. Uh, or at least think they will when they move there. So they make the most of it while they're living there. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, you have a high level of disposable income. Um, so you're able to kind of hop around. And when you do travel, it's really cheap when you get to that location. Yeah, yeah. So there's a kind of saying in Singapore that it's cheaper to go to Bali for a weekend, rent a villa, and have a great weekend in Bali than it is to go out for one weekend in Singapore. <laughs> I accept that. Yeah. So uh, what about Manila? You spent some time in Manila, part of the business, but what did you find there? Uh, Manila or the Philippines? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have very different experiences on both. Um, I've spent some time there. I would not consider myself an expert on the Philippines whatsoever. Um, but it's a city of about 10 million people. Um, it, has a lot of problems with traffic and other issues that I don't think we should get into. Oh yeah, okay. Well, we've covered that, you know. And I'm sure you have. One of the things that we've covered, not not only with respect to Philippines, but Michael Davis is a sort of scholar um, in Asia. He's in various schools now, teaching all over the place, including Jindal in in India. If you know about that one, um, but he he was um, teaching at Hong Kong University, and he knows. And he's a lawyer, a legal scholar, if you will. And he was talking on this chair just um, a few days ago about the, the constitutional process and its decline in Asia. You know, you would think that uh, all the economic success these countries have had would lead to uh, better uh, constitutional respect, if you will, and development. But it isn't really so these days. There's a move the other way and toward dictatorship, if you will. Right. Yeah. Did you see that? Did you feel that? Were you involved? Did you observe what was going on? I. Yeah, I I wasn't politically involved at all. Um, I think there's a huge concentration of wealth and power, and I think that disparity. Is, yeah, yeah, um, and I think that's probably fuel for kind of these uh, 
more, at least on the spectrum, going towards the dictatorship mm -hmm. side. Um, but yeah, it's outside of those political realms. Um, they're a bunch of great individuals just trying to make a living and get through life. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the other thing you, you you touched on it very briefly at the uh, outset of our conversation is about trying to protect um, tourists and adventure tourists for, uh, and, and keep them safe. I mean, what are, what are the challenges? What kind of lack of safety were you worried about? Yeah, I. So for that side, uh, it was as far as how people uh, or operators would approach new products that they were putting out. So if they're going to a new location. Um, I went on a trek that was a five-day trek with one of our operators uh, in Indonesia where I just kind of saw how him and his team were assessing different threat levels on bridge crossings on, okay, we can't take any, they had like school trips that occasionally came from the UK. Uh, they can't take any school trips of people who are under the age of 16 on these treks. Um, and just kind of seeing what systems they have in place. If something does happen when you're in a remote area or when you're under a stressful situation, what's the immediate protocol and how well have employees been trained to deal with that? Mm -hmm. If they have uh, Red Cross certifications or other applicable um, safety guidelines to go mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, what locations they're going into. Yeah. So. Well, were you worried? Were you worried about um, you know guerrilla fighters and uh, terrorism? No, we weren't going to southern Mindanao or <laughs> any really extremist areas. Um, so that luckily that wasn't um, really a situation for us. So this is a cakewalk. Yeah. And you had the benefit of going on these tours. You had to check them out. Oh yeah. To Quality check out insurance. these adventure tours. Quality so insurance. you took them all, didn't you? <laughs> Not all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was actually, so I, I got to travel to some of the most beautiful places, uh, but I was traveling for meetings, so I'd go to these wonderful locations and uh, be stuck in an office. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fascinating just seeing so many different sides of each country. Yeah, so what what um, what led to your departure? In two years, uh, maybe everybody goes for a fine period of time, come back, you alluded to that, uh, but why, why did you finish there and come back? Yeah, I think, um, I ended up leaving that company, um, and I, at that point, I started to miss a lot of things back in the U.S. Um, there's something to be said about being in your home country where you don't have to go through additional red tape. You don't have to take additional steps to do things uh, that should be simple. Um, I remember opening our bank accounts in Indonesia it was an utter nightmare. We had to go to the Indonesian embassy in Singapore probably eight or nine times to finish forms just to open a checking account. Um, wow. And then I had to fly to Jakarta for the final. Oh, finish. gee whiz. That's um, not efficient at all. Yeah, so uh, Indonesia was a lot harder. That was the extreme example. The Philippines was much easier. Uh, the three directors of our company all uh, were Filipino businessmen. Um, so they, they helped that process along. <laughs> Or else. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, would, would you recommend it to someone else? I mean, I always tell young people that before they get, you know, rooted in any particular thing in the U.S., uh, sort of the gap year, um, go to Asia, see what's going on, learn about the world, learn about Asia. Yeah. I, so before going, I worked for an investment bank for about two years. Um, and that helped kind of build a foundation to go off of. I wouldn't recommend going there without any experience whatsoever. Um, employment passes are becoming a lot harder to come by. And at least in Singapore, you have to prove that you can fulfill a job that no Singaporean can do. Mm, that could be hard sometimes. It's extremely tough for a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. Um, you had to go through that. I had to go through that. Uh, Why did you they, tell them? <laughs> Has your banking experience distinguished you? I, it was a combination of that. Um, I had an entrepreneurial project before banking experience, um, but it was this guy's the right fit for the job. He has this unique skill set of the uh, company I was with before, also did kind of more adventure work. Mm -hmm. um, so that with the business 
banking experience. Um, it kind of all merged together. And you word your story to kind of get sure. around that. And your boss helps you. Exactly. So. Um, and it's different if you are going in as an entrepreneur than as an employee. Most expats uh, who do go into Singapore are going in with the larger corporations. So again, my fiance went with Microsoft. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are with UBS, Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, um, <laughs> the finance industry. The reunion too. crowd over there, exactly, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and there's other large companies. HP, I have a yeah. friend who went over with HP. Um, Gee, this sounds really exciting. So, yeah. It's worth making the effort yeah, to definitely. get a job, to go there and play the game, at least for a while. Now, these other people, call it the reunion crowd, they're going to stay there a long time, or are they going to do the same revolving door that you did? I think there's kind of a cutoff where if you don't leave after five-ish years, you stay. Mm. You, um, mean, you mean... you. So I mean, that's the, just the de facto, yeah. the way it works. What people do is yeah. they go to Singapore and say, I'm going to stay there a year. They end up staying three years. Yeah. They say, I'm going to stay there three years. Yeah. They end up staying five years. Yeah. If you say, I am going to stay there five years, you're staying for life. <laughs> Isn't that um, something? I, yeah, it's an overgeneralization, of course. Yeah, of course. But, uh, yeah it was, I would recommend, if you ever get the opportunity to work abroad in a somewhat professional standpoint, um, it's awesome opportunity for anyone who's young and wants international experience. Yeah, sure. And international experience should never help you, uh, hurt you. <laughs> and, and English, did, you could get along on English. You didn't have to learn any other language to get along, eh? No, no. Uh, I think that's becoming easier and easier as time goes on. But English is the primary language in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, I did look, pick up a little bit of Tagalog uh, and learn elementary Bahasa Indonesia. Um, but. Say hello to me. Say hello to me. Uh, Salam pagi. That's good morning. <laughs> Apa kabar? How are you? Wow, I'm impressed. Uh, and while I was in Manila, I actually used to um, just introduce myself and let taxi drivers talk to me back in Tagalog, assuming that I actually spoke conversationally. <laughs> I don't whatsoever. <laughs> uh, but I would smile and nod and see how long I could get them talking to me. <laughs> Great challenge. So what's your advice to somebody who wants to be a tourist, for example, and go to the same area, not as an entrepreneur, but you know, just to enjoy the flora, the fauna, and the food? Yeah, I, it's, I think it really depends what you're looking for. So if you want to go to a place just to relax, go to a place that's famous with institutions in that location and infrastructure. So you can get a beautiful villa, beautiful five-star hotel in Bali, uh, and you will have an awesome stay. If you're looking to experience a little bit more of the culture um, and get something that's a little bit more of a unique experience, I would dig a little bit deeper um, and go to maybe of some of the more newer and expanding tourism markets. Uh, I went to Myanmar four years ago. Before the trouble. Uh, before the recent trouble. Yeah, with the Rohingya, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it was happening, it just wasn't on an international scale, scale. Yeah. or at least the media wasn't picking up on it as much. Yeah. Um, but that was pretty soon after they ended martial law over there. Yeah. Um, so a lot of capital was flowing into Myanmar at the time. <laughs> I don't um, think that's the case right now, though. Yeah, eh, you never know. You never know. It would be under quietly. Yeah? yeah. So one last thing, we're running out of time, but one last thing is, uh, you know, you take a trip like this, you go to a completely different culture. You, you know, you find the strength, the courage, the, the acumen to deal with it, not only in a, in a tourist sense, but a business sense. It's a pretty demanding experience, whether you realize it or not. And it has to change you, Andrew. So here you are, you're back. And my last question is, how did this all change you? I think the big thing that I learned is that the world is connected, and you can't unconnect that. So uh, just to be able to have our uh, management in Singapore and have an office of a dozen people in the Philippines and have clients all throughout Southeast Asia and be able to roll this out in just a few months um, was huge. And being in the US, you should be able to do the same thing if you're willing to take the risks to yeah. do so. Yeah. Um, so 
It's about learning the territory and then taking the risk on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think taking the risk is the big part that a lot of people aren't ready to do. Okay, we're going to take a risk now. We're going to close this down because we're out of time. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, been great to talk course. to you. Thank a you, homecoming Jay. of sorts. Nice to see you, man. Absolutely. <laughs>